Thank you for that kind introduction. I am Lucy Fang, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for the current session. We will be discussing leveraging model integrated evidence for long acting injectables, LAI, to reduce regulatory barriers. We have the privilege of opening our session with talks from two distinguished experts in this field. The first talk is by Dr. Andrew Hooker, who is a professor of pharmacometrics at Uppsala University. Dr. Hooker joined the faculty at Uppsala University in 2006. His research ranges between the methodological and applied pharmacometrics, including optimal experimental design, methodological problems associated with building and evaluating pharmacometric models, including using models for bioequivalence evaluation and the development and use of PKPD models in a range of therapeutic areas and drug classes. Today, he will share his insights on model integrated methods for generic LAI product development and regulatory assessment, current status and future research directions. The second talk is by Dr. Juga Goburu, who is a professor with the School of Pharmacy and the School of Medicine, University of Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland. He is a well-respected scientific leader in the area of quantitative disease models and their application to decisions. Dr. Goburu is best known for transforming the field of pharmacometrics into a decision supporting science. Today, Dr. Goburu will share his insights on how can model integrate evidence accelerate LAI generic availability. I'm Andrew Hooker. I'm a professor of uh, pharmacometrics at Uppsala University in Uppsala, Sweden. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, model integrated methods for generic long acting injectable product development and assessment. Uh, and I'm going to talk about both current the current status of, of research and future directions that we should be taking. So the challenge, of course, of bioequivalent studies for long acting injectable products is that these LAI products typically have very long half lives. And so if you want to run a standard single dose crossover study uh, for bioequivalence, then uh, you have uh, a test and a reference product that you want to give to the same individual. If you have a half-life of about eight hours, then the entire study may run, say, four days if you want to wash out the, the first product before you give the second product. Whereas for long-acting injectables that may have a half-life of, say, 40 days, then that washout uh, will take much longer, and so the, the studies will run much longer. So it's not really practical to perform these single-dose crossover bioequivalent studies for long-acting injectable products. So an alternative could be to run a, a single-dose parallel study. And that, of course, will work if, if you have uh, the ability to give the, the drug to healthy volunteers. Uh, but if you don't have the ability to give the drug to healthy volunteers and you have to give the drug to patients, then you probably have to keep them on treatment. And that means that you have to be giving them, say, uh, they, they'll probably be at steady state on some treatment and then you'll switch to some other other drug. So you'll be doing some sort of multiple dose crossover steady state study. And both of these studies have their problems. Uh, parallel studies end up with uh, covariates that give more variation within the groups because you don't uh, control within an individual uh, the different treatments. And then you have the uh, crossover steady state studies that if you have long, uh, long half-life drugs, the crossover steady state trial can run for a very long time. So uh, other problems, of course, with long half-life drugs are, are that uh, you may have more dropout because the studies are longer. Uh, and then, of course, there may be increased variation uh, in the steady state studies. Then people may forget to take their drugs. Uh, in single dose studies, then we have the increased variation because of covariance. And all of these bioequivalent studies, at least in general, are, are analyzed using non-compartmental analysis of pharmacokinetic parameters like AUC and Cmax, which we know are sensitive to missing data. They assume equal weight of all observations. Uh, they're, uh, 
poor estimates of, of the true underlying system if you have sparse data and it's hard to separate uh, different types of variability. A population approach, on the other hand, can actually address a lot of these issues. Uh, so they're built to handle sparse data. Uh, they work well with parallel group studies and incorporating covariates into the, into the models. Uh, they have a higher power to identify differences or similarities between groups. You can better separate different types of variation, uh, and you typically solve many of the problems that NCA-based analyses uh, cause. Just uh, some references here, then uh, we can show that pharmacometric approaches will typically have higher power than standard methods. In this case, this is an example of showing higher power, uh, the number of individuals uh, that you need in a study. In an Alzheimer's study, this is showing drug effect. Uh, but you expect similar results for uh, bioequivalent studies where you're trying to show similarity. In this, in this case, then, you could reduce the number of individuals needed based on a standard MMRM analysis from 2,500 down to around 500 if you both used a model-based analysis and you optimize that analysis by adjusting the sample times and adjusting the types of individuals you have in your study. Uh, there's other studies that show that NCA analyses can give biased estimates. This is a study from Ellen Svensson where she uh, made the conclusion that model-based analysis for drug-drug interaction assessments is preferable over non-compartmental analysis uh, for drugs with long half-life and should always be used when incomplete concentration time profiles are part of the analysis. So this was a, an example where NCA analysis gave a biased assessment of, of the uh, interaction between two drugs. So our group in uh, Uppsala have been developing uh, model integrated approaches for bioequivalence. And the general idea here is that any sort of bioequivalent study data, you fit that to a model or a set of models. And now those models will have treatment effects, inter-occasion variability, uh, effects if there's multiple occasions uh, on all possible absorption parameters in the model. And then once the model's been fit to data, then you can take that model, you can ask it, what is it, what, what is the mean area under the curve? What's the mean Cmax given this treatment or given that treatment? And then you can compare the two treatments. And we do that with simulations from the model. Uh, you take into account uncertainty when you simulate. Uh, and from that, then you can reach a, a bioequivalence, a conclusion uh, based on how, how the model fit the data, uh, including the uncertainty of the model or models. Since models can be biased, if you have the wrong model, you make the wrong conclusion potentially. Uh, we propose that you use model averaging techniques uh, so that you uh, avoid estimation and selection bias. And so we have a number of articles here just referencing how you can use model averaging. Uh, to assess uh, uh, the uh, effects of a, uh, uh, what the model tells us about a fit to data. Uh, we've pre presented previously results about uh, how these types of methods can control type 1 error uh, and generally give higher power. And in here we're looking on the, on the left, we're looking at type 1 error. And we had a number of different uh, uh, low variation, so with uh, little variability in the data, with high variability in the data, and with different numbers of individuals and numbers of observations per individual. So we have a number of factors here. And we could see that the, red, the orange is the model-based, model, -based model uh, integrated approach, uh, where we are con controlling the type 1 error. Uh, the blue is the uh, the NCA-based methods, which typically had lower, lower than the expected type 1 error for many of these situations. Uh, the overall power of these methods then uh, were also, uh, they had poor power uh, in general for the NCA-based methods compared to the uh, power for the model-based approaches. Uh, and the, the power was better for the model-based approaches when you had uh, high variation and sparser data.
So how can we use these model uh, integrated approaches to analyze long acting injectable bioequivalence studies? Uh, and one thing we can think about is just a crossover steady state study. So if we think about that, then typically what you'll have is individuals that are on some, some type of drug, they'll be at steady state. Uh, so that's the reference. And then they'll switch to some test product. And then you have to wait until they get up to steady state again before you can then assess uh, that PK profile. Uh, that can take a very long time, of course, until you reach steady state. And then you're comparing between those two uh, periods there. Instead, you might run a switch study. And in this case, then you're doing something where you're analyzing the test product without complete washout. So you have the reference product. And then after the first dose of the test product, you analyze in this first period. You still have a reference product in the system. So it's affecting the amount of concentration there. But models can uh, separate the amount of reference and test product uh, in this period and still give you an understanding of the area under the curve and the Cmax for both products. And you can then simulate out what would happen if I only had one or only the other product. So this would be a two month or two, uh, yeah, a two month study as opposed to a, a half a year study or more uh, if you if you had to get up to steady state for a crossover steady state study. So the research that we've been doing in the past few years has shown that uh, this type of approach uh, using a switch study as opposed to a crossover steady state study uh, will control type one error, uh, but it will require more individuals than the crossover steady state study. Now you can start to think, okay, if I did this type of study, then I could, uh, if there's uh, between subject variability that I'm really interested in, then maybe I could also take measurements in this period. So then I would have two periods of the reference, one period of the test. That would give me more information about the inter-occasion variability. Uh, or you might do uh, two periods in the reference and two periods in the test. And that would give you more information about inter-occasion variability. And this is where uh, future work uh, where we think is very interesting is looking at uh, highly variable drugs and how uh, how we can use these incomplete washout types of studies to assess uh, whether to to assess bioequivalence without having to run full four way uh, crossover studies or three way crossover studies that we would have to do generally to, to do a standard uh, reference scale average bioequivalence study. So uh, there's, we have a model integrated approach or there are model integrated approaches where we use modeling and simulation in uh, the bean analysis procedure. We fit models to data and then we ask what the models tell us about that model fit uh, to assess bioequivalence. This approach generally can reduce the sample size and or the reduce the study duration and potentially make bioequivalent studies more feasible, especially in, uh, in challenging situations like long-acting injectables. Uh, we also think there are areas that we can uh, further investigate. Uh, we can, for example, look at uh, more or other innovative bioequivalent study designs for long-acting injectables, uh, looking at these incomplete washout designs for high, highly variable drugs, uh, optimizing the designs in other ways, maybe using adaptive optimal or response adaptive designs to, to uh, re re further reduce the length of the studies needed and, and the number of individuals. Uh, we also think that uh, we can improve the model integrated approaches with uh, uh, assessing the, the weights for model averaging uh, by taking into account, uh, account the uncertainty of those weights as well as how to build models uh, if, if models aren't, don't already exist for a model averaging pr procedure. How, to, how can you do that in an unbiased fashion? Uh, something I haven't mentioned, uh, there are model informed methods as well, where you use your model to uh, change your ex expectations in a standard analysis. So you can do that in these switch studies. You can change the limits of your bioequivalence studies. Uh, and then run a standard uh, bioequivalence analysis with a switch study. Uh, they're not as powerful and they have some some uh, some issues, but they're at least uh, 
it gives you the ability to shorten the studies without uh, without using models uh, in as explicit ways as the model integrated approaches. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my views on model integrated evidence and how that can accelerate uh, long acting injectable generic availability. Here are my potential conflicts of interest. I would like to make four key messages. First thing is because the organization of the market, the way we have we, the market is, is, is set up, it requires or allows for high prices to be charged for many drugs. Individuals with serious health needs may be unable to afford effective medications and thereby fail to enjoy the health gains and higher quality of life. Sometimes a, the consequence is as grave as death. Only the advent of generic drugs for especially life-threatening life, uh, diseases and, and other life-improving you know, medications are uh, you know, allowed, the, allowed millions of patients to gain access to these innovations. And without the generics, that would not have been possible. So the, the lack of generic products is a national concern, in my opinion. The second point I would like to make is the barrier to entry for long actings is pretty high. Why is that? It is because uh, the bioequivalence, uh, you know, evidence requires uh, that the trial be conducted in patients. In, and uh, there are other clinical reasons to, for this to be conducted in patients because these are long acting. But that poses practical challenges. First, recruitment is, is challenging. Second, retaining them is challenging. Third is the that it, it increases the cost of the trial tremendously. And the trial ends up being for a very long time because if we want to collect steady state data, then these are long acting. Imagine how many dosing intervals, if it's a, every three month, every six month, every five year, uh, the trials could take forever. And the criteria that ought to be looked into uh, are much more than the conventional two or three endpoints of CMAX AUC. And so these are the reasons why the barrier to entry for long acting is much higher. The third point, however, is that modern methods are available and these are routinely used during drug development. In the interest of time, I will not go into the technical details as Dr. Hooker eloquently presented some of those. Rather, I would like to lay out the goals for such an accelerated generic drug availability if, if, if that is our uh, motto, what should we strive to achieve? That is what I would like to establish in this talk. Finally, uh, this, a, a scientific and regulatory consensus is needed from both parties, both the FDA as well as the pharmaceutical companies, so that we avoid surprises at the end. The, the efforts of the Office of Generic Drugs particularly of Dr. Liang, Dr. Fang, and others, they are doing a phenomenal job by leading the scientific community to coalesce towards fostering a solution. How are these methods uh, useful to accelerate generic drug development? First, these methods can be used to identify lead formulation. Second, we can use these methods to plan the pilot trial and analyze the results. Third is we can, these methods can be used to design and analyze pivotal trial in a more efficient manner. The first two are internal decisions for a generic company. So those would fall under de-risking. So you want to de-risk your program. That's the best way to do it. The last one is the goal is to pass the PE and increase the chances and uh, and then these, these methods can do that. 
let's drill a, a bit deeper into into these applications a typical generic drug development would be so a bunch of pilot formulations would first be considered the inception for that would be domain from domain expertise from literature from other mechanistic uh, you know formulation expertise now once you have the these uh, pilot formulations they are subjected to in vitro and animal testing that is where physiologic modeling and in vitro in vivo correlations can be used to uh, kind of streamline the the formulations tweak them go back if necessary to reformulate and also to project what is the likely outcome in uh, humans then you would do a pilot testing in 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 humans and this is where you know, we could use adaptive designs instead of the conventional designs which which again for those same reasons we talked last in the last slide uh, could could be very onerous and use model based analysis until this point it is all about de-risking it is all about within the company and and um, uh, and that that control over how much risk uh, the company is willing to take is within that team now once you identified the the winning formulation that is when you get into the total testing so this is where you would need to build the consensus with, with the agency in terms of the design the the way you're going to collect the data and how you're going to analyze the data and so on so that kind of a, a consensus is critical so this is where efficient designs and model based analysis are again useful for protocol testing now regarding the the fda's um uh, openness to embrace these innovative methods this publication by the um, ogd leadership which is present here clearly uh, alerts the pharmaceutical companies to avail these innovative approaches and have a dialogue with them and they this publication lists what are the some of the, you know areas where model integrated evidence could support a generic drug approval all right so what uh, what should be the goals of this accelerated generic drug development program i suggest four things one we should strive to come up for all long acting single dose trials and then the second should be to aim to cut the sample size in half the third should be that these trials should support fewer visits to the clinic for for labs the reason is these are patients and these are very long trials and having to collect frequent blood sampling and so on is not feasible so fewer visits is very important in fact it increases the retention of the patients in the clinical trial but these um, you know the the innovative approaches are going to be helpful to um, extract signals still from those fewer visits which are carefully planned these are informatively you know informative visits not not random finally the generic company and the fda ought to meet um early as early as possible in the development or at least prior to the uh, pivotal trial to gain consensus and generic companies have a lot to gain from the fda's advice in this matter because the agency is light years ahead of uh in terms of uh experience with these method methods uh, compared to uh, outside of the agency to summarize the key points i conclude 
that lack of generic product is a national concern. Barrier to entry for long actings is very high. However, we do have modern methods that can accelerate generic availability, and they have been used uh, in drug development and, and in various points. And then the, finally, uh, there is a grave need for a consensus between the scientific and regulatory uh, you know, uh, components to to make this uh, make this uh, uh, you know the the community embracing innovative approaches a success. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Hi, good afternoon. I am Lucy Fang. I will serve as the moderator for this breakout session 1B, Model Integrated Evidence for IOAI. I want to thank Dr. Stilga Gaburu and Dr. Andy Hooker for the excellent presentation today. In addition to our two speakers, we also have Dr. Niang Zhao, Dr. Kis Gadikalo, and Dr. Xiaoming Xi joining our panel discussion. Just a quick introduction, Dr. Niang Zhao is the Director of the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling within Office of Research and Standards, OGD. As introduced this morning, Dr. Zhao has a broad spectrum of scientific and management experience from industry and regulatory agency. Dr. Keith Gadkilo is a consultant in clinical pharmacology and bio biopharmaceutics with expertise in the area of bioequivalence, drug-drug interactions, and pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic and clinical endpoint trial simulation, endpoint trial design, and data analysis and interpretation. Dr. Xiaoming Xu serves as the lab chief of the branches three in division of product quality research in office of testing and research, well, he needs multiple research areas, including complex formulations and advanced manufacturing. So before we, so welcome all of you to our panel today. Before we take any questions from the audience, I want to hear from Dr. Keith Gadkilo to share with us on the challenges in the design, conduct, and data analysis of non-acting injectable BE studies from the industry perspective, Dr. Gadikilo. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Lucy. The main industry challenges and issues in BE studies of long-acting injectables occur when studies are conducted as a crossover design at steady state in patients and multiple doses of each treatment are required to ensure steady state has been achieved and enough time has elapsed to eliminate drug from the prior treatment during the buildup phase of the subsequent treatment as per guidance recommendations. As a result of these guidance recommendations, multiple dose crossover studies of long acting injectables with long half lives in patients have too long an overall treatment duration. Example, and go for four to six months of monthly injections of each of test and reference antipsychotic long acting injectable products. This poses long, this is this poses logistical, clinical, scientific, and product development challenges for study design and conduct as discussed by the speakers. Logistical challenges are difficulty in recruiting patients for the specific disease population and high dropout rate. Clinical and scientific challenges are increased chance of non-adherence to protocol restrictions, increased prevalence of missing data, increased use of concomitant medications, which may lead to PK drug-drug interactions and potential bias in the geometric mean test to reference ratio for AUC and CMAX. Also change in disease state with time which may change systemic clearance following treatments, which leading to potential bias in the geometric mean ratio. The main project development challenge is increased duration and cost of generic drug development program. Also two injection sites are required for some B studies, example, the deltoid and gluteal muscle for palliperidone and pump are injectable suspension. 
which increases the complexity of the study, though the apparent terminal half-life can vary with site of injection, one site, example deltoid, should be sufficient for a B study. Requirement for intensive PK blood sampling and more than one dosing period per treatment, example, aripiprazole ER injectable suspension is onerous and leads to high number of blood draws in patient population, thus affecting recruitment and retention of patients. PK sampling in the first dosing interval after the treatment sw switch should suffice per the switching design presented by Andrew. You need to know the operational multiple dose or clinically relevant half-life that explains attainment to steady state to determine number of doses for these steady state studies. Such data may not be reliably derived from current B study designs, depending on the duration of the dosing interval relative to the half-life. Therefore, reliance on obtaining reliable half-life information from the literature is critical for designing B studies of long-acting injectables with long terminal half-life. There are also data analysis issues. The classical statistical methods are insensitive to evaluate attainment to steady state from successive trough concentrations for treatment experienced subjects, for example, the use of Helmer contrast or linear regression. Because subjects are already at steady state with a reference product before dosing the first treatment period, Therefore, only small changes in trough concentrations within between products are expected for two bioequivalent products, which leads to uncertainty in number of doses needed to substantially eliminate carryover effect from prior treatment following the crossover. Also, it's not clear from the product specific guidance of how many subjects need to reach steady state if evaluation of steady state is based on individual data sets instead of aggregate analysis of data pooled across subjects for each treatment. Finally, current analysis variant statistical methods do not adequately address the high intra and intersubject variability typically observed for CMAX of long acting injectable statistical methods incorporating ANCOVA analysis covariance or study designs that are amenable to ANCOVA using baseline PK parameters as covariance could be considered for reducing PK variability and study design and thus sample size. Recognizing that long acting injectable extended release suspensions usually display flip flop PK in which the terminal half-life reflects drug release from the injection site instead of drug distribution elimination. That is, the terminal half-life may be formulation dependent for some long-acting injectables. And concluding, most of these in industry challenges and issues can be alleviated by the modeling described in Andrew's presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Gary Kilo. I think that's a very nice comprehensive summary of the industry's pain points. So now I'm going to turn it over to our I, uh, wonderful panel to share with us some of your thoughts in terms of the modeling opportunities and also the future research need to address some of those challenges. Could we start from you, Dr. Zhao? Sure. Yeah, first of all, thank you all for your interest and very uh, Uh, to the field of a challenging long-acting injectable area. So I have been enjoying the talk by Andrew and uh, Joga. It's so inspiring. And I also want to tell everyone that in the coming uh, November, we will have a dedicated workshop for this particular topic. I think that's where uh, that we can exercise the most of human intelligence in terms of bringing uh, uh, challenging product long-acting injectable to the market to meet um, the public health need. I think there will be, um, I think I, I'm pretty sure that I will see a very good opportunity for model integrated approach to bring uh, deliver good value to the public health in uh, over here. Uh, the thought could be, you know, I, I heard, you know, we can use model integrated approach we can use, um, there are other, could be other thought about, um, that there will be three type of benefit, you know, the reduction of a sample size, reduction of study duration, and uh, a new potential, uh, potentially a new, more sensitive uh, PK metric that could be more sensitive to formulation change. All those are very good thoughts that can deliver real value to the industry. You know, also with the study design, we can think about uh, a model integrated approach and also model informal approach in terms of uh, reducing the 
study the original only for, for example we can uh, certainly um, have a PK measure on each of the subjects uh, that's participating in the study and then project the rest of the PK profile and also uh, we can think about how to intelligently value, verify validate the model to allow uh, a full extrapol uh, extrapolation you know in terms of what is sufficient model validation val verification that's the state of art in the field I think the expert panel later on need reach to agreement for the regulatory utility what it consider the model has been sufficiently ver verified validated with that, I also want to seek some input from the panel members uh, as well, hopefully today. So that pretty much is the thought currently I have. I will um, want to give more opportunity to other panel members to share their original thinking. Thank you. So, so now go to you, Dr. Hooker. Thanks. Uh, I think there's some really nice points from both Liang and Keith. Um, and I was just going to comment on a couple of their points and then uh, point out where I think the most important things are uh, to think about for model based approaches. So uh, I think I think one point that Keith made that was very important is that when you have these models that are uh, they, take, they have a long half life, there's lots of variability. Uh, and then you're trying to assess when you've reached steady state. I think the current way to do that is look at three points at trough and then try and create a, a line between those three points or do some sort of linear regression. And the linear regression has to include the, the zero slope. And that's a really insensitive way of, of identifying whether, you, whether you're at a steady state or not. So I think that uh, model-based approaches even there can, can help you determine when you should expect to be reaching steady state. Just doing a simulation based on some uh, maybe prior knowledge of the, of the reference product. Uh, and then Liang made some points about model validation and verification. I think that's uh, really key is trying to figure out uh, how do we, we heard this in the morning sessions that people were talking about uh, the problem with the model-based approaches is that you don't know which models to use essentially. Uh, and so we do need to have some sort of validation procedure that tells us uh, that these models are adequate enough to, to use in, in, in the process. And I think that uh, one key there is that we should be doing some sort of averaging procedure. We've, we've seen there's lots of research showing that uh, uh, ensemble modeling, so uh, combining models and, and taking the, the results of many of those models together, uh, will tend to overcome this problem of uh, 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 a model being built on a set of data. So you, you end up having a less biased model. Uh, and I think there's a number of ways to do this sort of verification and validation. So uh, uh, lots of uh, tools like uh, creating posterior predictive checks of AUCs and CMAXs, uh, assessments of like, uh, uh, um, now I can't think of the residuals that I'm, I want to say. NPDEs, uh, looking at the NPD residuals, uh, you could uh, uh, look at visual predictive checks in certain certain instances. So I, I think there's ways to do this that uh, can avoid the uh, the appearance of bias when choosing which models to use. Dr. Hooker. So, Dr. Goburu, now it will, we will come to you. So, in your presentation, actually, you propose some like four suggestions, like such as single dose studies, fewer sampling. I mean, really good idea. Thank you. So, I, I would like to hear from you, like from more from imp implementation perspective, do you anticipate what are the, some possible challenges when we implement those new approaches? Yeah, so the the single most, I think, uh, challenge is that we we have been 
uh, using modeling historically to estimate um, mean typical values. That's all. We we do we don't we don't develop models to describe individual data. So when we talk about bioequivalence, there are uh, one can make an argument that you could still estimate the the mean parameters for comparison, but uh, the way that the mean is is I mean everybody on this call, at this conference knows right. So we we take the average of the ratios. So that means the model has to be reasonably robust to gen generate or impute missing values in the profiles for each individual. That's the first thing. Second is the availability of the models is predominantly for the reference compound product. But you 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 could we could do uh, spend and exhaust every which method that that's under the sun uh, and in some of the other fancy stuff that uh, Andy was talking about statistical model comparisons that's fine too we want to throw that in but the key challenge I think is uh, can that quotes qualified model appropriately estimate the geometric mean ratio of a product test product for which the model was not picked. So can we pick up those uh, rate and extent uh, of changes in the code's viability uh, from the reference accurately that we have a reasonably unbiased estimate of the geometric mean ratio. So those uh, two aspects, and I, th I think we, we can achieve that. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident. It's just that the, the modeling community has not focused on this type of problem, which is a, a different presentation and different uh, needs. And hopefully in the November workshop that Dr. Zhang was mentioning, that we would be able to spend more time uh, on, on these topics. Certainly. We We'll spend more time in a, in a future work, in a sh upcoming workshop. So, Dr. Gadikilo, we will skip you in this front. So now I will come to Dr. Xu. So based on your experience with the complex formulations, I want to hear from you in terms of the research need, more from the uh, formulation, capitalization, optimization, and the IVIVC perspective. If you can share some thoughts in that regard, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. Um, so I want to bring to the conversation a slightly different, but a very relevant um, aspect to the uh, modeling um, to supporting the long acting injectable. And that is the, uh, I think from the understanding of the release mechanism, the, the formulation, um, particularly, I think for, for the type of long acting injectables, it's not a, a generalized, there's one category, but rather, I think there are multiple categories uh, that we need to view them uh, separately in terms of uh, uh, what are the risks and the challenges or even approaches to consider the type of modeling. So first one uh, could be the, uh, uh, the API itself uh, is the, uh, in the, uh, as a, as a long acting injectable, the suspensions, injectable suspensions, drug is in the crystalline state, and then the release mechanism generally dictated by the dissolution. Um, and uh, the local environment in the uh, tissue, the site of uh, asset, site of injection uh, can dictate some of the dissolution behavior and absorption behavior. And, and second category is uh, more of a polymeric based uh, uh, biodegradable, uh, like injectable. So certainly in those cases, the drug release mechanism is dictated by the erosion diffusion of the polymeric material. And oftentimes a uh, highly, highly influenced by the local environment, uh, accelerating the degradation, etc. So oftentimes you do not see very clear correlation between the in vitro dissolution data uh, and the in vivo uh, PK data. Um, and the last category is uh, uh, the uh, non-biodegradable uh, or, or another type of polymeric based, uh, but typically controlled by the diffusion mechanism of the material. So I think depending on the type of formulation, depending of, uh, on the uh, type of um, a dosage form, uh, the release mechanism um, can vary. And uh, we need to consider those uh, release mechanism 
into the uh, uh, development uh, and uh, uh, utilization of the, the modeling approach uh, oftentimes can help with the development or understanding the variability or the differences between in vitro and in the evil correlation. So I think that's an area uh, I know OGD and uh, broadly speaking, the industry will have been invested in that area of understanding for those complex uh, like injectable release mechanism. But uh, I think uh, it's highly important we continue to expanding, continue to develop and uh, utilize those knowledge that we have learned apply into this uh, modeling effort. You're following that you. one, Xiaomi. Thank you for your sharing. I do have a uh, feeling, common feeling that currently for lung injectable, there are two programs. One, the in vitro part, the other is the in vivo part. Today, we are mainly focusing on the in vivo part. However, I see there is totally disconnect currently between the in vitro testing and the in vivo study design. Uh, another approach, you know, we've always been talking about IV, IVC. However, if we really want want to have a mechanistic IVC to be established, we need the in vivo data to verify the model, you know, the model pre mechanistic prediction. And at the end, that could be more costly or time consuming than just to go ahead and conduct a clinical PKB study. So, you know, with that, I want to challenge the panelists here. What do you think what would be the additional research that should be conducted to make the connection? You know, I think to uh, you know leverage the learnings from in vitro experiments to uh, lend us more confidence in terms of trusting the uh, model. We have been talking about a model verification validation. Can we also borrow part of the in vitro testing result? as a part of the model verification validation. Uh, you know, I, I don't know whether the panelists have any input in this regard. Yeah, uh, I, I can take a stab at it. I, I, my suggestion is from a purely strategic point of view of where do we want to invest and now versus a little bit later, uh, that the understanding of the mechanistic aspects, like you correctly pointed out, uh, how do we relate the in vitro testing to in vivo without data? So, and the only folks who will be generating that would be the generic industry uh, companies. And uh, if 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 I am a generic company. And I have to develop three different formulations and matching in vivo profiles. Uh, I'm here trying to make a case to do single dose, short, and and skinny studies. And now you want me to do three, three, three different formulations, so on. So that um, I think there would be a there would be a day. Uh, I, I I'm optimistic that we would have more mechanistic understanding. And this is this is where actually uh, you you have the uh, you are in the best position because it is possible that you would have some generic companies look at other you know formulations. Then you create a database internally, and then you can actually uh, have access. You can look across the companies then come up with a potential relationship that can then be used not just for that product, but perhaps generalized across products. But that is going to be slow brewing and, and kind of takes a little bit time. So uh, my suggestion is that we uh, always try to grab the lower hanging fruit, which is a little bit more empirical approach, but still much advanced than and and less regulatory burden to the companies than the the conventional approach in parallel we invest in this long-term understanding uh, that could be led by you know ogd uh, and and then eventually we we could uh, come up with a, a a very strong 
in vitro program to, to support the approval. Thank you, Dr. Kopuru. I, I think certainly understanding the mechanistic mechanistic part from in vitro characterization and also link that to in vivo will certainly help accelerate the program as well. So that's another direction we are also exploring. So given the interest for the interest of time, actually we are running out of time. We are already over one minute. So I will thank you all for participating in this panel. Thank you so much.